Over the years, a lot of people have asked me about my Rickenbacker 325, where I got it, how much I paid for it, etc. Well, I figured it would actually be fun to do a video where I talk about one of my guitars. Of course, then I thought, if I'm going to do that, I might as well talk about a whole history of John Lennon's Rickenbackers, because that's the whole reason I bought it. And then I figured, well, then I'm probably going to have to talk about reissues and then go through a sound demo. So, originally this was all supposed to be one video, but I ended up getting to the 20 minute mark and I had barely finished talking about John Lennon's Rickenbackers. So, this is going to be a two-part series. So in this part, we're going to do a deep dive on the history of John Lennon's Rickenbacker guitars during his time with the Beatles. In part two, I'll go more into the technical aspects of these guitars. We're going to look at reissues and buying options, and then we're going to compare to see if they're actually accurate to the original ones. Also, we're going to do a sound demo so you can hear all the amazing tones that you can get out of these tiny guitars. So without further ado, let's get started. Right before we start, I just want to make a little disclaimer here. First and foremost, I am not affiliated with Rickenbacker or any other companies. I'm not getting paid to do this. This was just a pure hobby and I hope it gives educational value to people interested in this subject. And on that note, you can't really talk about a historical figure like John Lennon without using historical photos. So I have tried my best to give credits to all the original photographers or the publishers that currently own the rights to the image. It takes a long time to research these photos, a lot of them I had to scan or buy books just to get myself, and it's even harder to track down the original photographer in a lot of these cases. If there's any that I've missed, please let me know, reach out to me in the comments, or shoot me an email, and I will update this video with the right citations. Once again, all this is just intended as educational content under fair use. I wanted to do a very brief history of John Lennon's Rickenbackers. So for those who don't know, John actually used two famous Rickenbackers throughout the Beatles' career. And yeah, I'm aware he also rarely used two other models, but the main focus of this video is going to be on his, well, main guitars. John's first Rickenbacker, serial number B81, was a 1958 model in the Capri series, which was actually a line of semi-hollow body guitars. However, the lack of a sound hole means there's really no visual indicator that the instrument is hollow inside, and it really looks more like a solid body guitar, which are typically less expensive to produce. And it is true, I mean if you pick up the guitar it's fairly obvious that it's light, but I mean if you saw it in a catalog in the 1950s you would have no way of knowing that it's semi-hollow. Later models had a sound hole, but again John's didn't, which is why many experts suspect his was part of the initial production run. Now I'm not going to go into the full details of how John's guitar ended up in a German music shop all the way from Rickenbacker's factory in California, but I am going to say that it was originally configured a bit differently. It's generally believed that you can spot John's Rickenbacker, yeah, his actual guitar, a couple years before he bought it in a series of 1958 trade show photos in New York. You may notice this guitar looks a little different than John's, and besides the fact that it's a natural finish, which don't worry, we'll get to that in a second, you may also notice that it only has two control knobs. I guess these things weren't selling very well, and they were sitting in Rickenbacker's inventory for a while, so at one point they actually refitted the instrument and added two additional knobs for volume and tone. They also changed the knobs to these, which we sometimes refer to as oven or stove cooker knobs. Aren't you being rather arbitrary? This is the configuration the guitar was in when John purchased it in 1960. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to refer to this configuration as Phase 1. Some important things to note about the guitar at this point. It had an unfinished fretboard, a natural finish, oven knobs, and a Kaufman Vibrola. And the evolution begins. I whipped up this graphic on Photoshop to help keep things simple, but it's just mostly a graphic, so don't expect it to be 100% accurate in terms of color and everything like that. For whatever reason, Lennon was sort of known to have problems with the knobs on this guitar. By 1961, one had already fallen off. By the summer of 1961, Lennon made his first set of modifications to the guitar. Kaufman Vibrolas are sort of known to be troublesome on Rick 325s, and John obviously felt the same way, so dissatisfied with the Kaufman, he had it replaced with a Bigsby B5 unit. It's also important to note that the Bigsby came with its own floating bridge, often referred to as the bowtie bridge due to its unique shape. 
What's sort of funny is that the original bridge on his guitar was probably better. The pickguard sort of gets in the way of the bow tie bridge sitting properly. And if you look at this picture from 1964, you can see his low E string is just like off the fretboard. Here's another cool photo showing the action on his guitar, which probably wasn't really that great, but again, I don't think John really cared that much. Either way, he probably just did this because he thought it would be cool to have something new. I mean, sometimes it's just cool to have something new. Also, apparently right after having the Bigsby installed, John purchased a new set of knobs from an electronic shop up the street called Beaver Radio. Just on a side note, I particularly really love this photo because it shows John's guitar in its natural finish. It looks a bit more orange to me than the natural finishes on the reissues nowadays, but that could also be the lighting. Here's a slightly lower quality version of this photo with I guess more natural colors, but the guitar still looks pretty darn amber to me. I don't know, you tell me in the comments. I guess it could be the lighting or you know like stains from cigarette smoke, but again it seems weird that the color would change that much in such a short period. Cause the guitar was new just what like a, a year and a half before right? Either way I'm getting off topic, let's get back to the story. These beaver radio knobs are highly sought after for collectors trying to replicate this era of the guitar's look. Unfortunately, they are close to impossible to find. Sources tend to indicate that they're actually the ones used on an ever-ready sky casket radio from the 1950s. I also just want to mention that there's some controversy regarding these knobs because it's really hard to tell what color they actually are. I mean, in photos, they sort of look like they're black rimmed and they have chrome tops, but again, people say that they're actually brass top. Maybe the brass wore off at that point. Again, maybe it's the lighting. I don't know. But you'll find actual reissues of these in both configurations. Some of them are brown with the brass top. Some of them are black and have chrome tops. So you're going to have to look at the photos and see which ones you think are more accurate. I decided to look up other models from this era, and it turns out EverReady made a bunch of models in the Sky series of radios. The 1958 Sky Baronet, Baronet, Baronet? Wait, then the other one would be Sky Cascade, and that doesn't make Okay, the Sky Baronet. This one comes with black and chrome, so look at that. And just to show you this isn't some kind of fluke, here's another picture of this same radio, a different collector though, and you can see, again, the knobs are black and silver. Here's another photo, and you can see that the knobs do kind of take on a gold look when they get hit by a certain light, so again, it's hard to tell. And just for fun, here's a Sky Baby with red knobs and looks like gold? I, I can't even tell. The point is they were making these things in a lot of different colors and configurations, so is it really that much of a stretch to guess that maybe he could have gotten them in black and silver? I don't know. I wasn't there. This is what I'd call phase two. At this point, John's guitar still had a natural finish, it had Bieber radio knobs, and a Bigsby B5 vibrato with a bow tie bridge. As we can see, this definitely changes the look of the guitar. I don't think John actually ever used the Bigsby, but it was probably better than the Kaufman, and those radio knobs kind of look cool. I also want to point out that almost immediately after he had that Bigsby put on, the black paint behind the Bigsby lettering started to flake off. At this point, the guitar was famously refinished in black. I think it was also around the same time, but the knobs were changed to Hofner style teacup knobs. Here's a great recreation my buddy Marcelo did. Fun fact, I believe these are actually the exact same knobs that Paul had on his Hofners. You can actually spot these knobs fairly easily in most photos due to the cream colored rims. They're sort of a giveaway. So here's phase three. Probably the most striking change so far due to the new paint job, but I should also mention that the black paint behind the Bigsby lettering had completely flaked off at this point. My friend Marcelo, who is a Beatles expert, mentioned that the fretboard had taken on a darker appearance by this point. This is likely due to it being unfinished wood combined with finger oils, cigarette smoke, and any other kind of stains they got on the fretboard. Not long after though, these knobs started to fall off as well, and Lennon was once again left with a three-knobbed guitar. It seems like he tried to take a little bit better care of his guitars this time though, because he had all four knobs again by 1963. But within a few months, he was down to three again. Honestly, I have no idea why John had such a huge problem with the knobs on this guitar. Once again, the guitar remained like this until mid-1963, when Lennon had Burns London perform maintenance on the instrument. Experts say the fretboard was sanded and refinished at this time, and given a clear coat. The neck also took on a noticeably redder shade than before. Finally, we reach phase four. 
Visually, the main difference is the addition of polished aluminum burn-style knobs, but it's also rumored the pickguard and the finish was touched up a little bit. One fine detail is that the pickup selector switch tip was also changed to black. This is how the guitar would appear on the famous Ed Sullivan Show performance in 1964. Looking at photos, it seems like Lennon's guitar was already starting to take some damage towards the end of 1963. You can see that the headstock is already looking kind of rough. Here's another good shot of the guitar. The headstock is now looking pretty bad, although this shot does give us a pretty good look at the burns knobs and the new pickup selector switch tip. See, it's not evident on black and white TV, but color photos show that Lennon's guitar was absolutely beat to hell at this point. The finish is completely scratched, and you can literally see the paint scraping away around the headstock. Now I just want to say there are more details that I have skipped over due to time constraints, I just can't cover everything, but if you're interested in this topic, I would highly recommend checking out Beatles Gear by Andy Babiuk. It's probably the best resource out there about Beatles Gear with all the instruments the Beatles played. I have read it from cover to cover, and I can't recommend it enough. Check it out. So just a quick summary of V81's phases during John's ownership. Phase 1, we had the stock arrangement with oven cooker knobs, a Kaufman Vibrola, and a natural finish. Phase 2, we had the addition of a Bigsby B5 Vibrato, a Bigsby Bowtie Bridge, and Beaver Radio Knobs. Phase 3 introduced the famous paint change to black, as well as the addition of Hofner Teacup Knobs. The black paint behind the Bigsby logo started to flake off, and the fretboard took on a noticeably darker appearance. Phase 4 adds burn knobs, the new pickup selector switch, and the refinished fretboard. I also want to mention that there's a whole wealth of information about the wiring and pickup arrangement for this guitar. I know that John, it's rumored that he even disconnected the middle pickup on his own. The guitar was likely tinkered with by him and several luthiers, and there's really no way of knowing what his specific wiring state was when the guitar was in his hands. But I would recommend checking it out online, there's a lot of information about how to get that sound. There's a lot of stuff that people do from unwinding their pickups to buying specialized wiring looms online to help them get that sound that's closer to John's. 58 Rickenbacker sound. Boys, are you buzzing? No oh, thanks, got the car. No, 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 listen. I'll have to play it back. You'll have to do it again. So back to the story. It was clear at this point that John's guitar had seen better days, so Rickenbacker presented him with a brand new 1964 Model 325 in Miami, just right before the second Ed Sullivan Show performance. You can see him using it during rehearsals for the second broadcast. The serial number of this instrument is DB122. Oh, and just a quick sidetrack here. The way Rickenbacker's naming system works for these guitars, technically they're all in the Rickenbacker 300 series of instruments, but this series includes many, many other models. Think about it like this. The base model for these particular short scale guitars is actually the Rickenbacker 310. With Rickenbacker's format though, another pickup is plus 10, and a vibrato is plus five. By this logic, the possible arrangements of these guitars would be a 310 with no vibrato, a 315 with a vibrato, a 320 with an extra pickup but no vibrato, and finally a 325, like John's, that has an extra pickup as well as a vibrato unit. So back to the story, this new 1964 Model 325 had quite a few noticeable differences from the original. First and foremost, it was painted black from the factory. This color is referred to as Jet Glow by Rickenbacker. The guitar was also fitted with a new type of vibrato called an accent vibrato. The knobs are now Rickenbacker's standard black style, and speaking of knobs, it also has a smaller fifth knob that allows you to blend the tone. The pickguard was changed to white rather than gold, and now it features a two-tiered design. The guitar is still semi-hollow, but the wood has been changed to maple. John's original from 1958 was made of alder. Alder is a lighter wood, which means the newer model was roughly two pounds heavier, seven pounds total according to Rickenbacker's website. The 1958 models weighed in at five pounds, despite being a fair amount thicker as well. In terms of thickness, the 1964 models are fairly slim at one and a half inches, whereas the 1958 model is over half an inch thicker. Still, it's a lot lighter though because of the type of wood used. I believe both guitars had similar fretboards made of either Padauk or Bubinga, also known as African Rosewood. It's important to mention though that this new guitar actually had a finished fretboard from the start. 
This new guitar also had Klusen Deluxe tuners, whereas his original featured Grover Statite tuners in the Butterbean style machine head. Although it's hard to tell, the headstocks are also shaped slightly differently. To me, the 1964 is more streamlined and narrow in shape, whereas the 1958 has a sharper edge and appears a little bit wider. This bridge is similar to the stock bridge on his 1958 model, before he modified it with the Bixby of course. These bridges are also sometimes referred to as roller bridges in reference to the rolling saddles used. This newer model also came with a nifty chrome bridge cover. The pickups are both Rickenbacker's toaster style, although some say the wiring is different on the earlier models. Back then, all these pickups were hand wound, so there's bound to be a bit of variation between them either way. I believe the necks were fairly similar, although I've heard that the 1958 model is a bit chunkier. There are some other minor differences as well, but I'm not going to be able to cover all those today. And speaking of necks, there's something I haven't mentioned yet. These guitars are short scale, and I mean seriously short scale. So I wanted to have a little bit of fun just to emphasize how tiny this guitar actually is. So, for reference, a Fender Stratocaster is 25.5 inches, and that's the scale length of the neck, right? Gibson makes their guitars, generally, at 24 and 3 quarters. Fender considers their Jaguar model to be short scale, and that clocks in at 24 inches. And just for fun, Squire's Stratocaster Mini, which I think is primarily marketed towards younger players, is advertised at 22.75. Okay. The Rickenbacker 325 has all those beat though, with a whopping 20.75 scale length. That's 20 and 3 quarters. It is ridiculously small. This is honestly one of the smallest guitars I have ever played, and it's really hard to get across how tiny it is without actually playing it yourself. Apparently John liked these guitars because of how easy it is to play chords and riffs on the short scale. I'm gonna be honest, they are not great for lead guitar, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. For the most part, John pretty much used this Rickenbacker as his primary live guitar until the end of 1965. You can still see him playing it at the December 1965 Christmas shows. By 1966, John had switched over to his famous Epiphone Casino, and he stopped playing the Rickenbacker for live shows. And I know I said I wasn't going to do this, but since I mentioned John having two other Rickenbacker 325s and everybody's going to comment about it anyway, one of them was a Fireglow model with an F-hole, which was actually the export version referred to as a Rose Morris 1996. John used one of these briefly as a replacement guitar after dropping his main 325, but there's very few photos of him actually playing it. Most pictures appear to be from the 1964 UK Christmas shows. John also had a custom 12-string model Rickenbacker made for him, referred to as the 32512. I admit it's cool looking, but it had to have been an absolute nightmare to play given the 325 scale length. I don't think John really ever used it that often. I've seen it pop up in random photos a live show at the Boston Gardens, as well as a Dutch TV special, both in 1964. I know he brought it on tour with him and he used it as a spare backup guitar, but I don't think he ever really actually played it that often. As a matter of fact, I doubt John actually ever played this on a record either. It's been rumored for a while that John played the lead guitar on every little thing, but experts seem to disagree, stating Harrison played it. Still, John shows up in session photos with the guitar, so there's really no way of knowing. Back to the 32512, visually the guitar is pretty similar to a regular 325, except it has a trapeze tailpiece instead of a vibrato unit. Also, the headstock is slotted with Rickenbacker's unique 12 string design. I never really liked the way the truss rod cover looked on John's though, it sort of looks like it's been squished or something. It does look like they adjusted it a bit on reissue models, and even though it might not be like accurate, I think it looks better. Still, these are relatively niche guitars, so unless you've got a bunch of spare cash lying around, I'd go for a regular 325. Total side note here, but this session is also the last time you can see John playing his original 1958 Rickenbacker as a Beatle. So just think about that. At this particular moment in history, there were three Rickenbacker guitars owned by John Lennon at this same session in the same room. That's pretty cool. It seems like a lot of weird stuff was happening at this session though, because I'm not really sure what is going on in this photo. 
you know what? This gives me an idea. Let's do a little bonus section called Not John's Rickenbackers. So this is actually George's Rickenbacker 425, a guitar most people don't even know he had. It's kind of cool to see John playing around with it in a couple photos, though. Here's a much more famous Rickenbacker owned by George, the famous Hard Day's Night 12 string. Just as a comparison, if you're used to seeing John with a Rickenbacker, you can see how much bigger a normal Rickenbacker is than the 325. Well, that's it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you've been watching me for a while, you know this isn't the type of content that I normally do, but I figured I'd try something new. So honestly, let me know what you think. Also, I'm gonna post all the Ruddles style background music that I recorded for this video, so you can see that in a separate video. And make sure you check out part two where I talk about reissue models, buying options, mods you can do, comparing them to the vintage guitars, and finally, a sound demo. Stay tuned. Oh my god.